expect that so many people will uh, show up. Maybe we should have had the lecture in the second floor, but the next time, hopefully. Uh, so uh, many of you here, I don't know, I see also people that are not studying uh, here, may maybe not in the bachelor uh, program anyhow. Um, uh, but the second and the third year students know about Erlang and the first year students will find out about it next year and see how awesome it is. <laughs> and um, uh, <laughs> hopefully um, yeah, be inspired uh, by, by it. Uh, for, for me, uh, it, it, is, it was um, a, a new experience to, uh, to, to find out about this and I was very grateful that I can study our life because it is not uh, so often, uh, not many universities often offer this. And uh, then uh, I thought that all of you um, who are studying this would be great to find out one of the person that actually thought about the language first and uh, to, to ask him what, uh, what your, uh, maybe have some questions, what you want to know, and uh, yeah, to know um, how, did, how did the idea about Erlang came, and what is the plan for Erlang in future. Uh, I would like to thank Francesco for teaching us Erlang, uh, he, and for um, helping uh, me uh, get Joe here. Uh, and uh, I would like uh, to thank some of the students that um, I would like to uh, thank Kian from first year that uh, helped me make the poster, Max who helped me to uh, put the posters around. I would like to thank Helena for encouraging us to do this, all the, the teachers and uh, all the students because um, because you like your life, probably. <laughs> That's why you're here. So I will not say any more. Um, um, and give the word <laughs> to, to Joe. <laughs> Thank you. Well, th thank you all for coming. Um, I'm very flattered that so many young people came. And, um, what, what I, think, I don't know how long I'm going to talk for. Um, probably I'll talk for about an hour and then take a little break and then those of you who thought what this old bloke was going on about was terribly boring can sort of sneak off and, <laughs> and then I'll carry on a bit more and, and maybe we have a, a bit of a discussion afterwards. Um, uh, I'm very pleased actually with, with, you know, with some people actually learning to program and do because I've been programming for uh, quite a long time and um, I think after about, after about 20 years of programming I got sent on a management course and, and um, all these people had progressed to being managers and we went around the class and they said well what do you do and how many people are you in charge of and um, we got to meet I mean they were all like well I've been programming for five years and now I'm in charge of ten programmers and I'm a manager they were mm, that's pretty good and we got to me and I thought like, well I've been programming for 20 years and I'm not actually in charge of anybody and you know, they were on this course and I could just feel loser and that was 20 years ago about 30 years of programming you sort of get the hang of it, and after 40 years of it, it's still got the hang of it. And the funny thing is, I still like doing it, which is kind of, kind of strange. Can you hear me? Is that the problem? You can't hear me. Actually, I can't. No. If you get a microphone, it might help. Because I'm actually talking quite loud at this end. My voice will, oh dear. Do we have a microphone? That's not a microphone. <laughs> um, in the other first, yeah. if, if I talk loud enough that you'll hear me, uh, my voice will give out after about 20 minutes. Can, can you move forward a bit, maybe? Or, or we'll, get a microphone. Sure. No, we'll get a microphone. <laughs> anyway, I'll, I'll sort of start anyway. Here. Um, this talk's going to be a bit of history. I'll, I'll just show you what Erlang was like in 1986 or whenever it was. And uh, I just got some old pictures. I always quite like showing them because they're um, a bit different to how it is today. And then we'll fast forward a bit to, um, to what's going on today. And then we'll fast forward to what I did last week because for some reason I always like telling people what I'm sort of doing at the moment. 
because that always seems much more fun than what we did 20 years ago. And, and then we sort of look at some problems that we should be solving in the future. Um, my generation of computer scientists has completely fucked up everything so that you've got an awful lot of problems to solve. You know, once upon a time, computing was quite simple. You know, there was only one programming language to learn, and there was only a few, you know, you only had like 128, I don't know what you had, like 16 kilobytes of memory in your computers and everything. So they were quite easy to program. And now we've buggered everything up, so they're very difficult to program. We have to do something about that. Um, and you will have to do it, not me. Not like you. Is that better? Wait a minute. Is it turned on? Hello. <coughs> Hello. Can you hear me at the back? No, it's still the same. Why? Why doesn't? Hello. 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 Yeah. Yeah. It's just now. Because I don't really want to shout here. Can you hear me? You have to. Put your hand up if you can't hear me. I mean, that position. Right. <coughs> I think it's just. The okay. position, maybe. Right, hands up everybody who can't hear me. Great. <laughs> so, a bit slow today. Um, yeah, if anything was the answer, then what was the question? Um, well, here's some possible answers. Um, how do we write programs that interact with the real world? Um, I'll, I'll talk a bit about that. Um, this is the question I think... Um, it's kind of interesting at the moment. It's interesting me at the moment. How do we glue programs together? Um, that might be an answer to gluing things together, although it's not all the way there. It's part of the way there. And how do we rely? How do we write reliable software from components which they themselves are not reliable that will crash? Because it still makes things reliable, even if we know that they're going to crash. Um, they're not quite as reliable. But, um, and so the talk's sort of like this. Um, introduction, talk about abstractions, message passing, isolation, and glue, encoding protocols. I'm going to lead you through uh, notions of message passing and why it's absolutely <coughs> beautiful and why everything else is complete rubbish and uh, isolation and how we glue things together and so on. Uh, and sort of throw in bits about philosophy and kind of something along the way. Um, and I, I'll probably swap lectures as well. Uh, uh, well, the world consists of communicating objects, I suppose. I suppose that's obvious. Uh, it's obvious to me. I mean, um, I've got a slide a lot later on that shows that in a bit more detail. But um, I mean, I used to be a physicist, you see, so um, there's only one way we can communicate, and that's by sending out light, photons, or, or sound waves or something. I mean, there's no, that's the only way, that's how the world really does communicate, you know, some rays of light and we receive them. And any abstraction that doesn't um, honour that is actually flawed. And I'll, I'll give you some examples of some flawed abstractions later. Database abstractions are often flawed because of that. Uh, and using the wrong abstractions when you program can actually turn very simple problems into very difficult problems. So, for example, um, Romans sort of didn't have very good abstractions, so Arithmetic was artificially difficult for the Romans. You try and do that in Roman arithmetic. I mean, the Romans weren't very good at arithmetic. Mm. Uh, it was possible. I mean, you could do this. It was even more flawed than that, because the Romans uh, didn't have a symbol for zero. <laughs> and so they couldn't express this notion of zero. Um, which is rather, rather embarrassing, you know, because their maths was hindered by the fact they didn't have a zero in it. And, uh, the notational systems had that. And, if you change notations and the way you think about things, then some problems that are quite difficult can become quite easy. So I could do a bit of that. Um, oh, well, objects communicate, I would say, by asynchronous message passing. This is the basis of object oriented programming. It's the basis of how we think about parallel programs. Um, let's see. Um, Alan Kay was the man who coined the term object oriented programming. And uh, he uh, did this at about 19, oh, well, it was about 1970, something like that. And uh, the first proper object oriented language was, was um, Smalltalk. It was implemented by Dan Ingalls. And uh, of course, people misunderstood 
what object-oriented programming was all about. So I think Alan Kay wrote this famed message to, to, to the squeak mailing list. He said, um, the big idea in object-oriented programming was all about the messaging. It wasn't about the classes and, and the hierarchies, the inheritance hierarchies. That's, how, that's, that's abstract data types. That's encapsulation. The big idea is messaging. And that, <coughs> that's kind of got lost. So you don't see clearly the messaging in, in Java. You see the objects, the object hierarchies, and the, 